What's up, guys? This is Taylor Roberts from the band Riding With Killers. Be sure to check out our debut album, Full Circle, which is streaming now on all platforms. Please be sure to check out our new music video for Novelty, which just released this past Valentine's Day. And you're hanging out with John the Ninja. Ladies and gentlemen, how you doing? It's John the Ninja live. And again, I know it's not the Studio A, Dojo Day, Jang's, John the Ninja Studios. We are remote. We're running around. Uh, the current location, now I can relay, is actually Florida. So, you know, we, we got some things happening. But more importantly, we are joined by another spectacular guest who I have to admit I'm very jealous of. Yeah, I, I can't hold it in. This guy has lived a very fun and fascinating life. He originally is from Mississippi, but this Taylor is actually from Michigan now. Taylor, Michigan. Isn't that ironic? He's an actor, a painter, 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 since I can't say that, but for all intents and purposes, he is a musician, and he's been influenced by bands such as Tapper, Papa Roach, and the new metal scene. If you were growing up in the early 2000s like me, you remember it fondly. But he's also validated being endorsed by Gibson and Seymour Duncan, trying to get one with Puff Co. If you guys are listening, Puff Puff. Please, please, God, I love my Peak Pro. It's so good. This gentleman has the work ethic of Corey Taylor and Tobias Forge, having forged his own path, and on that path, having worked with bands such as Vince Sevenfold, Atreya, Bullet for My Valentine, Seven Dust, Charmanti, again, there goes back to being a little jealous, and again, Taproot, who will be important. But he formed his current band in 2018 from the ashes of former projects, which were successful in themselves, but has created something new and strong. This band I speak of is Riding With Killers, a Detroit-based walk alt-metal trio recently that released Full Circle, their new album. The group blends a fiery mix of 90s alt rock, industrial, new metal, but the sonic is what you gotta listen for because it is actually quite beautiful. The album was produced by Matthew LaPlante and their latest single is DNA, which is out now. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I give you Taylor Roberts. Good sir, how are you doing? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to, to sit down and chat with you, man. Man, you were ready to go, too. You had the guitar ready. You were, like, you know, getting the rudiments. But the first thing we got to hit, because you, you are self, you're self-proclaimed on these two things. One, you said you're a nerd. And then, two, I know you're a wrestling fan. So we got to bring it back. One, who's Batman's greatest villain? And number two, who's your favorite wrestler, man? Are you keeping up with wrestling currently? I haven't kept up in current years. I was, like, a, a WCW, NWO kid, and... Um... I hung on a little bit when WWE came around, but then, or I think it was WWF first, and then it went to WWE. Um, so I, I was more along the lines of the WWF days, and then like, you know, I, I all of my favorite people just started dissipating, and I was like, well, I don't care anymore. <laughs> um, but I would say, so first off, um, Batman's greatest villain, he's right there. Yikes. <laughs> and um, I would say my favorite wrestler was always between Sting and Goldberg. Those are my two. Man, you got to watch AEW. Sting's still going at it, man. Is he? Yeah, 60 years old. I only know this because I love wrestling. I'm still in it. I've interviewed wrestlers, but. Hey, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Still jumping off of the Raptors, still going through tables. It's 60 years old. Wow. I hope I'm not cool at 60. My God. Man, you will be. Let let's also get into this. There is a there is a Jason, you know. I was curious of his name. Uh, Jason from Revo Media. I was wondering what his last name was. Oh, Jason Arnt. Okay. I'm probably not saying that right, but it's A R N T Z. Arnt. Arnz. Arnz. I love Jason though. He's a great, great guy. Uh, we've been doing some wonderful work with him over the last year and a half or so. He's done two music videos for us. Um, I was just featured on the cover of Revo Review, um, and he did 32 um, special edition covers. And there's there's a bunch of athletes, entrepreneurs, businessmen and women, um, just all these wonderful influences. And the fact that he wanted to include me on one of the covers is just such an honor. And uh, he's a really great guy. He's a great visionary. He's opening a brand new studio over in Grand Rapids. The space is phenomenal. And uh, it's it's one of those like I like he's about to do some amazing things. Like I know that for a fact, especially seeing all the all the things that he's bringing into the new studio space, the vision that he has, the people that are like, hey, we want to be a part of this. And they're helping him bring his dream to life so he can make other people's dreams a reality. Like Jason is uh, 
he's a phenomenal human being and I'm, I'm very happy to know him. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of work with him moving forward for sure. And speaking of dreams, man, you know, I mentioned Taproot a lot for those fans of yours. They know that you grew up. That was your band. You know, we, we take it back to okay. Caleb McBride's days back with his mom, Susan, and how they got you into heavy metal <laughs> oh and rock. And, you know, for, for me, it was very much like very a, a lonely journey to find my way to playing music. And when I found ACDC, I can't relay how many weekends I'd be in the basement with a guitar that could not be tuned, playing on the E string, playing every song, rocking out. And for you, that dream came true, and now you're actually playing with them. Can you walk me through the the initial time where you first played with the band and what that was like? Was Miss Susan there to see you play? Unfortunately, she wasn't. Um, now, are you talking the first time I ever got to play a show with them or actually play with them? You know what? That's an interesting question. Which one was more of that, you know, coming full circle moment? Was it just playing? I would assume playing with them with the first time, but then there's a different level of like, hey, I'm indoctrinated in the band now. It's a totally different feeling of like, now my heroes are my peers. Yeah, that's a great way to put that. Um, I, I would say there, there, there's really two moments like that. Because my first initial show that I ever did with Taproot, my old band Cathars just opened for them at the Soul Kitchen in Mobile, Alabama. And um, I knew something was different immediately because um, I was hanging out with Phil Lipscomb. Um, and, uh, and I hung out with Mike even too, but like, I realized like an hour and a half later into it, I'm like, we're still hanging out with Phil and like, he's actually like hanging out. And this is, this is odd. Cause you know, I, I grew up watching these guys on MTV and they were one of those six, seven new metal bands that were such a heavy influence on me, even pursuing songwriting or wanting to continue learning my instrument. Um, but the second time we played with them um, was pretty huge for me because we were doing CPR Fest in my hometown. Um, and that's that's our big radio rock festival that 97.9 uh, CPR puts on. And um, we had been very fortunate to be selected on a number of years. And I remember I walked up to Phil and I kind of poked him on the back. I was like, hey, man, do you remember me? And he's like, yeah, Taylor from Catharsis. And my jaw went, yeah. So I was like, what do you, what, like, not only do you remember my really stupid band name that's hard to pronounce and spell, but like, you remember my name, like what's actually happening here. And, um, I, I, I felt something was different in the air at that very moment. And then next thing you knew, we were on tour with those guys for a month. Um, and, um, it just, I got spoiled with them because that's that's honestly the best tour i had been on to to date you know like every single person in the band steve um mike phil and at the time dave coglin who was playing drums for them on tour like i just i felt such an insane connection with them and i found myself hanging out with them more than i did my own band which was kind of odd and um and that's what led Dave and I to start writing music together because he's the drummer on the first Writing with Killers record, Full Circle. And, um, you know, once we kind of started getting that finalized, which it took like almost five years to make that record, you know, COVID happened in the middle of it and Matt was in Wisconsin and we were trying to figure out going to and from. But, um, you know, once Dave uh, sent the music out, I, I got a phone call Um not last year, but the prior year. So it would have been tw December of 2022. And Phil's um, like, hey, man, um, do you want to be in the band? And I I literally just started bawling at the dinner table. I was with my friends, uh, Matt and Sam Stillman, and, and my wife, Macy, was with me. And everyone is like, oh, my God, who died? Who died? What's going on? I was like, everything is wonderful. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I would say the biggest the biggest full circle moment. It wasn't the first show, weirdly enough, because I think we were all just kind of, oh my God, we're, we're back in the saddle, we're doing this. But I think I really first felt it at Taste of Madison, because um, that was, we, we did the white out, you know, that was the first time Taproot had done that since um, Ozfest um, back in 01, 02, I believe. And um, it just hit me. Like there was a point where I was, I was playing, uh, I think I was in the middle of birthday and I just like, 
I, I kind of started getting teary eyed and like, I couldn't sing the next part for, like, I only missed one, one vocal part, but like, it just hit me. It was like, dude, I, I'm, a, I'm playing guitar for one of my, my heroes right now, my, my childhood hero bands. And it was, it was just a very, very emotional moment because I was connected with the crowd. I was connected with, with the other guys on stage and it just, it felt so right but it was also so bizarre at the same time, you know, it, 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 it still doesn't seem real. Like, I don't think that I'll ever get used to this. And man, those tears of joy, they really hit different. Like it's, it's a weird concept for people. You know, we're men, you know, we're not supposed to cry. You I know, think when we, we do need to cry, change the narrative you know, on that, man, because this is something that I've been holding on to more recently, but crying is powerful. Crying is a beautiful thing. And, and, the way that I view tears, tears are recurring battle scars that we carry with us, but we're not ashamed of our battle scars. In fact, we show them off, do we not? Mm. You know? So I really think that like, cause I know that, that like, like what you said, that's what people have instilled in men for so like, you got to be the strong, blah, blah, blah. But I think crying is strong. I think that shows a vulnerability, but it also shows an immense strength from within to, to show that side of yourself. And um i didn't mean to i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off but like i just i really wanted to touch on that because that has been an idea in my mind for i would say really the last three or four years where i started to kind of figure myself out and try to turn my world around uh in in so many ways when, when it comes to to health mentality um or mental health rather um and and, and physical health so um that's that's kind of my viewpoint on that <laughs> sorry about that. i love how you brought that up because we will get to the mental aspects of mental health and how that in, you know is in and sprinkled in the music but you know for me having I had a couple of interviews with some actors you know of course you know i grew up with a very stereotypical family you know you got to be tough you know if you start to cry mom's here she's going through bad you got you know strengthen but i've noticed being a wrestling fan and having dealt with actors, like you said, there is a power to crying. So I guess when I see a man cry now, not so much like, hey, he's hurt, you know, give him a hug, but more so like those tears of joy, you know, it's very, I see the storytelling behind it, you know? Sometimes you can tell, it's like, okay, there's so much, like you said, the battle scars, so much pain that they've overcome that now that it's finally released, there's no other way to really express it. Like you could jump, you, th there's an adrenaline jump and then there's that, that finally I did it, and I feel like those tears are the re uh, the relief of the job yes. finally completed. But you know, let's let's go back because a lot of your writing, a lot of your influence stems from growing up. And something that I found interesting now that me and you don't have it in common, but my family do, that you are a professional painter. You know, you I think at the beginning of the pandemic or like nearing the end, you got your first like really big gig for your company, and you got a full full building in Detroit, but. You know, what was mom and dad's upbringing with you like? I know that your grandfather and your brothers, I believe, are military now. Um, I did want to st stress some questions on that. But what was, how did you feel you grew up? Was it very supportive? Was it more of like, a, you know, really like, hey, you got to find your way quickly, you know, toughen up, son? Well, so you just opened up an entire box for me. Um, and, and I'll say so, um, it was my uncle who was also in the military with my grandfather um i have a half brother that i do not speak to um and i've got two step brothers that i don't really speak to um i i am a, i didn't have a dad growing up um i am the dirty dark secret on glenn's side of the family like i i don't even care i'll throw his name out there um but like i i i'm essentially a bastard um uh, my mom did most of my raising as did my grandparents um so that was kind of the way that I grew up. And I mean, I have a stepdad, um, but, um, you know, I, I appreciate his effort, if that's the right word, but like, we're not close. Like, um, like, and, and I don't mean to say this to sound mean, but nothing of what I'm doing in life right now can be attributed to his teachings or him bringing me on as a son. I feel like Jim Pinkston was more of my dad than anybody. Um, and, and I share that with, with Ed Bridal as well. Um, he was a very big father figure to me growing up. So 
were these just um, guys around the way, kind of like, hey, you know, he was my teacher or he was a family member? Could you specify who they were? So, Jim Pinkston, um, he owned Pinkston's Music, and I spent almost 20 years of my life under that roof. I started guitar lessons there at about age 11, I want to say, and then I started working there when I was age 17 until Jim unfortunately passed away um, when I was 27, 28. Um, he had a, r a very rare form of cancer, but he kicked the hell out of it for six, seven years, and you would have never known it. Like, he he knew that he still had stuff to do on the coast. Um, but even through all of that that pain and suffering, he still found a way to to make me feel like I, I was his redheaded stepchild that he actually loved. <laughs> um, but um, he, I would say he really taught me about life, love, business, music, and and everything in between like for some reason he saw something in me and he wanted to take me under his wing like um i still chat with uh with his son jimmy um you know he and i used to spend the night at each other's houses play guitar all that good stuff but um jim saw that fire within me when it came to music because music was the one way i knew how to express what was in my heart and on my mind but i didn't know how to verbalize it but music always said that and um, Ed Bridal, he's also someone who was involved in music for me. Um, he was a financial backer for Catharsis for many, many years. Like the reason I got on, and, and honestly, I wouldn't be in Taproot right now if it wasn't for Ed. Um, he helped us get on tour with them. He helped us with radio campaigns. He, And then through that, um, I developed a very special bond and relationship with, with Ed and his wife, Kelly. And I would I would drive to Arkansas. He would come down to Mississippi and um, we just spent a lot of time together. And he always used to tell me I was the son he never had. And um, he, I would tell him he was the dad I never had. And so I I kind of got my education from from various other men who I, get, I don't I don't want to say felt sorry for me, but saw something in me. But they realized that I didn't have that strong father figure in my life. And um, that was kind of where I got my education from that. And then, of course, you know, my grandpa, you know, taught me a lot growing up. And um, that's where I kind of got my painting education from was through him because um, he was Air Force. But then when he retired, he opened up a flying field with six other families, I believe it was, in Gulfport, Mississippi. And people would fly in from around the country, have him paint their airplanes. And so... Um, that was kind of where I got my start with with painting and all of that. And uh, and yeah, yeah. So kind of weird on the family front for me. Um, but, you know, I think that's part of the story. So I, I used to be really pissed off about all of this for a very, very long time. But I feel within more recent years that I've kind of found my place in the world more so like I've I've come to accept it. I've come to terms with it and i think i'm happier you know than i than i have been because that's that's a big thing man being a boy growing up without a father and and then you get a stepdad but then it doesn't turn out quite the way that you would hope that it would um you know it was it was weird it was very weird thus i'm weird but we can't skip past how fortunate you you are for coming to grips with your reality. Like I remember Steve-O was talking about for a long time, he suffered with um, survivor's guilt. You know, you just, you, he was in a better place than others and it messed with him. You know, listening to your story, I'm reminiscing of my father who, you know, it was out there. He hung out with the other side of the family. It was just no connection with his dad. And even though I see the influence, like he, we have Uncle Jimmy. Love you, Uncle Jimmy. God bless you, man. But I can I can finally see like, OK, the way he acts mimics this. I can see the interaction. You know, my dad, other than my mom, I, you know, it's hard for him to open up emotionally. And me and right. him have butt heads. I love him. The things I do, it, it sucks because we're the same person. So it's like, <laughs> you know, out here in the world, I've, all the teaching he gave me, I'm like 007. I'm getting into places I shouldn't be. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting that respect. And then it's like he sees me and it's like, boy, you still can't. You know, he's he's so articulate and smart and it's like it's it sucks because I'm like, I'm trying to connect with you, dad. And we're just the same person, but two different personalities. But that's why I love music, because that's what got us together. You know, he hated the wrestling, but ACDC, Ozzy, you know, that's where I, we established that connection. But to be able to say like, hey, you know, I, I have comfortability and I'm grateful with the people who 
outstretch their hand. You know, those relationships, because it's not blood, tend to be stronger at times. Um, so back to granddad, because, you know, I, I, I had to throw it out there because we're both history fans. Yeah. And, you know, World War II was a big war. We, you know, we both have our respective ideas of it. One of my favorite periods in time, man. Um, that was, uh, and, and I didn't mean to cut you off, but, like, I, I have such a respect for the men and women of World War II because, I mean, that, that shaped our entire world. It, it could be totally different if things had gone the other way, you know. And I was curious because, you know, I'm a big history buff. And that war is one of the ones, like, no matter what you do, it, there's always a story. There was always something going down. Terrible, but also fascinating. You know, what was probably one of the stories that sticks out the most to you that kind of really stuck with you? I think of John R. Fox, who received the Medal of Honor, African-American soldier who pretty much got a bad rep. He was stuck in a building, you know, they're evacuating an Italian city, and it's just him. Everybody else is gone. There's still civilians, and basically by himself, he calls artillery strikes and holds off the Germans long enough to, yeah. you know, get people to safety. Ends up saving part of, part of. I, sorry, I want to say unit, but I want to say with just other soldiers and other civilians. And at the end, had to make the ultimate sacrifice and go, man, I'm boned. Blast the place, and you know that's one of those stories. It's like you know that's. Even even in the moment, even if that's the last decision, to have the the bravery to say it out loud, to go for it, you know? Is there a particular World War II story that sticks in your mind that you'd like to remember? Like one, like, specific story? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say, I, I would say there's plenty of those, but the one that sticks out, and, and this might seem cliche or, or blanketed, but, um, like, really, when you think about uh, Operation Overlord and, and, and D-Day and, and the storming of, of, of of Normandy beach. Like I, I just, I always think about what was going through all of those young men's minds as, as they're in the U boats and they're, they're heading towards the shore and they know as soon as that door opens, like 75% of them aren't coming out, but they still did it anyway, because they had this insane duty to the world, not just to their country. It was to the world. They were fighting for everybody. And um, that is something that sticks out to me because I'm like, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm sure if the call arrived, I would be there. But like, when you think about that, because knowing what we know, um, it's just so crazy to think that, that they stormed right into death's gates with, with that bravery and that, and, and just that honor, you know, um, that's, that's what sticks out to me the most, I would say, because that was that was an insane day absolutely insane day and and you know so many people just laid down their lives because they wanted the world to be better and and that's what really sticks out to me the most i would say and everybody you gotta know i thought this was pretty cool my man t taylor always watches save your private ryan around d day that date. i don't know yep. specifically i forget the date june 6th thank you because they messed it up. Man. Six, man. You know, that I feel like that is my way to honor the fallen and, and to keep that. Because that's something we should never forget. We should never let that go by the wayside. The gravity of, of what actually happened and how world-changing it was. You know, and, and I'll tell you, one of my favorite places in the entire world, and if you've never been there, um, I highly suggest you go to the D-Day Museum in New Orleans. Um, I have probably visited close to 20 times. I'll spend three to five hours there every single time I go in there. And as many times as I've been, I always discover something new. And, and of course, they're always changing exhibits and finding different pieces that people around the country and the world have donated. Um, but it's, it's a very, very, um, I think everyone should go at least once. Um, but it's it's a wonderful museum, so I highly suggest it. Uh, and just go to New Orleans anyway; it's the greatest city ever. So, Tommy Buckley of a uh, <laughs> crowbar told me the same thing. I'm trying to get there. He was man. You want to meet a guy that's fun? Ooh, Tommy's great. But you know, back to back to the idea of like, yes, I, I found it fascinating because you know we we're we're army. I'm an army brat at least. You know, we're veteran kids. You know, it's it's in our blood now. We have a certain reaction. It's a little bit more 
physical. Now, when we see vets, we have a heart for them. You know, are you okay? You know, we've seen the trauma and have far from the understanding of what it actually is, but we, we, we witnessed it for them. And you said something, you, you were interested in joining, but you didn't. And I think at the time you were still trying to figure out yourself, still, you know, working on yourself. And you said, oh, I'm not, I'm not cut out for it and stuff like that. And I found that interesting because guys like you are very much the ones that either, you know, they didn't have any direction and then they go and then they find that like, oh, this is my calling. Or, you know, they kind of get the jarhead routine and just get, you know, morphed into it. But the, the tenacity you've had, the work ethic of just grinding since 14, having multiple jobs, trying to make it, doing what you love. You know, I, I always, I was curious, like when it came to that initial moment, you know, you, you had your reason why you couldn't do it, but was there still doubt or were you kind of like, no, I can, I can definitely do it. Cause I always felt like, yes, this is the type of individual that would succeed even if they don't think they will. My, my grandparents and parents obviously were pushing for me to join the air force cause we're an air force family. My grandpa did it. My uncle did it. Um, and weirdly enough, like in earlier, earlier iterations of catharsis, um, I mean, I had guys from the Navy, I had guys from the Air Force, I had guys from the Marines that were in my van. So I've always been around military personnel. Um, but, and this might seem selfish, but I can't lie about this. I, I ultimately decided I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to be told that I couldn't go live my life. If that sounds, I know that sounds so shitty and I don't mean for it to, but I, I knew what I wanted to pursue and I knew I couldn't do it if I went into the military, because like you said, you, you jump into that. I, I know that I would have found my place there. I probably would have become a career military guy, but I knew in my heart that wasn't who I wanted to be. Um, and I didn't think that I could pursue and I'm sure I probably could have, but you know, this is 15, 16 year old me, you know, let's, let's bring it back to that mentality. It's not the clarity that I have at, at 34, almost 35. But at the time I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to have to be on base all the time. I'm not going to be able to go on tour. I'm not going to be able to get these shows that I want to get to. And it was, it was honestly because I thought music would not be a part of my life the way that it is now if I went into the military. And uh, I, I really hope that doesn't come off shitty towards any other soldiers because that's not my intention. Um, obviously, I love and respect the military. I just, I didn't think that I could do it. You know, I didn't know that I would be the right guy that was cut out for the job. And, you know, if you're out there in war, I mean, again, the call comes, you say you can't do it, but in the moment you probably do. Um, I was just worried about how I would represent our country and <laughs> I was the right guy for the job. I mean, I got red hair now, you know, and, and tattoos. I don't, I don't, I don't think I scream military, you know? So, um, that was kind of my, my reasoning. Um, and I'm sure they probably would have said something about my left eye here. Cause it's, I, I have terrible vision, so, you know. Man, you would have been primed for sniper school, trust me. And you know, you know, <laughs> that would have been something that I probably would have actually really, really, really enjoyed. Um, that that would have been cool, actually. Let's start there. When you actually started doing music and started going for it, you know, I am a Gibson dude, man. And I love the SG, ACDC caught me young. Of course, Maiden, you know, Adrian and all of them played. You know, when it comes to playing certain instruments, oh, she's a beauty. That's, this was my first Gibson ever when I was uh, when I was 14. My mom saved up, single mom, worked her ass off, multiple jobs. But uh, I still got it. And uh, this was my introduction to Gibson was, was an SG Voodoo. So I feel you. <laughs> Did you have to modify it? Because, you know, my first guitar, I got my baby right here, was a Fender. I got, this, got the SG Safe, but, man, I destroyed this thing. I got a Rammy bar. I messed up the bridge. I couldn't stop breaking the top. The, I'm sorry, not the top. It's the low E string. So you know what I yeah. mean. And that's hard. You're really, you know, digging in. You're not supposed to. So, you know, before before we get to the uh, other question, you know, did you did you have to make some modifications? Did you destroy her a little bit, or were you gentle with your first oh. guitar? I feel like I am ruthless while also being gentle when I play guitar. 
Um, I, I, um, I've never really broken anything cause I, they're, they're my children to a degree. Um, the only mods I ever really do is I'll change the nut, um, to like a bone or a tusk nut and then I'll do locking tuners. And if I don't like the pickups, that's maybe what I'll swap out. But nine times out of 10, I'm, I'm usually pretty happy, but those are, those are the three mods that I. I generally tend to, especially since I joined up with Seymour Duncan, like I try to put those in all of my guitars. Um, I really like the ratio locking tuners. Um, and then, like I said, the graph tech uh, tusk nut is, is what I tend to go for. But um, other than that, man, I never really mess with like the pots or the wiring or, or any of that. I, uh, okay. The fourth one, I, I put Schaller uh, strap locks on all my guitars. Um that's what I've used since I was probably 15 and it's what I'll use till the day I die. I absolutely love Schaller. So who were those guitar influences that were very integral? Maybe it's not the style you play now, but they got you going. Like for me, ACDC, of course, Angus and Malcolm. I already said Maiden. I hate to admit it. I love him to death, though. Metallica was very influential in my style of playing. And that comes with years of like what you, when you start realizing like, oh, what I know off the top of my head, I'm like, Damn, I know a shoot load of Metallica, bro. Like, <laughs> so you know, who were those initial influences that set you to go like, okay, I need to mimic this, and really were the uh, the blueprint. All for one, uh, the song that made me want to play guitar. I heard "Between Angels and Insects" by Papa Roach. That intro, like, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it in my head and playing it. But like the first time I heard that, like, I was like, yo, what's that? I was like, how did he do that? I got to know how to do that. Um, and then from there, um, I would say uh, Davy Johnstone from Elton John. Um, that was my first concert, actually, at like age nine or something like that. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> uh, hey, honey. Oh, I forgot how beautiful you are. <laughs> yeah, dude, totally. That's that's exactly what just happened. She just got back in. And I was like, wow, there she is. Um <laughs> Um, but them, I would say uh, Jim Root from Slipknot, um, Mark Tremonti, and then our Lord and Savior, Jerry Cantrell. He, he's got a great story, too. I love that. He was in school, and he's like, oh, I'm dropping my books. Let's go. And I was like, what? <laughs> so, yep. you know, I, I'd have to know, man. When did you start acting or being an extra? Because the way you got writing with Killer's band name is so outrageous to me. First off, you were an extra in the Motley Crue film, The Dirt. Yeah. So now I'm sitting here like, okay, and then this guy named Shay, as Shane Bouvier, I believe, or Bouvier, yeah. offers you a job. And I'm like, first off, you're already on the set of, of, of the, the movie. All right, y'all strike up a conversation. Like, that is so out there how, like, you know, yeah. you were questioning, like, hey, is this guy trustable? And your boy was like, yeah. And then you're riding with him. He's like, wow, I could be riding with a killer. Hey, that's a good name. You know, what was the job? How did you get into acting? And what did this man pay you? Because you made, like, 2K a week. It was it was pretty yeah. good. Basically, within, uh, before I moved, the, a couple years prior, um, because of, like, tax laws and everything, a lot of movies and tv shows moved to new orleans because you know like they, a lot of places will film in atlanta you know they have your studios in la but from what i understand like um just with tax rates and other things like that in terms of money and things i don't understand um i guess it was just way too high out there so they moved it over to new orleans and um i just i think i just quit wildfire and I was I was browsing the internet and and it popped up like hey do you want to be an extra in the Motley Crue crew film and I was like that sounds really fun and I was like I've never done this let me just give it a shot and I got a call back and um we were there for like 12 to 14 hours like I didn't leave uh UNO lakefront because I did a bunch of the concert scenes with Shane there uh we didn't leave till like two or three in the morning it was wild um but we just sat next to each other and then um he because they they didn't cover my tattoos that was the funny part so he and he's got a bunch of tattoos but they put makeup on him and he's like bro why didn't they cover your tattoos and i was like i don't know and then we just got to talking and he was like are you are you a musician and then it turned out we knew like 10 of the same guys from the gulf coast and then we just struck up a really good conversation got on to 
you know, Pantera and, and uh, I Hate God and, and Down and, you know, all, all the all the New Orleans style, you know, I mean, even though Pantera's Texas, but it's still Phil, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then we just, we found out that we really liked each other and that we, um, you know, we had a lot in common. And uh, basically he owns a business where he does vinyl wrapping. Um, and he was like, hey man, you want to come wrap these houseboats in Atlanta with me? And I was like, I have no fucking idea what that means, but um, yeah, I'll come do it. Especially because he was like, I'll pay you like two grand for the week. You won't have to do food, lodging, travel, whatever. And I was like, uh, yeah, I'll do that. Cause I, I had never made 2000 bucks in a week in my life before. And um, you know, before the trip actually started, we were going to be flying there. And then it was, Hey, no, we, we might take a train. Hey, no, wait. We're going to take a company vehicle. And then it was like, nah, man, we got to go up to my mom's house in Hattiesburg and I got to switch out my vehicle, get their vehicle. And then we're going to go to Atlanta. And so I was like, okay, this is starting to feel a little weird and fishy. Like what's up with this? And I called a mutual buddy of ours, uh, Matthew. And I was like, yo, I was like, is Shane cool, bro? Cause like he offered me all this. He keeps changing how we're going to get there. And like, now I'm just kind of worried that I'm going to end up scattered across the highway to Atlanta in like six different trash bags. And uh, Matthew started laughing his ass off. He was like, bro, you ridiculous. He was like, he was like, take your ass out there with Shane. He's like, if that's what he says it's going to be, that's what it's going to be. And honestly, it was one of the best weeks I've ever had in my entire life. Um, we went up to Lake Lanier, Georgia. Um, Margaritaville had bought a plot of land on the lake and they had bought two houseboats that were already you know, there as part of the deal. And what we did is we took uh, vinyl graphics and we put it all over both boats. And I think we, we did like, that was the first houseboats that had ever been wrapped. But if you Google Lake Lanier, Georgia, Margaritaville houseboats, the yellow and the blue one that we did those, me and I, like we were out there working till 1am almost every morning. And then, um, we met uh, some of the people that lived and there's a little houseboat community on the dock. And like these, these houseboats are bigger than my, than my apartment. Um, but I met like the guy who owned Georgia fiber. Like he runs all the fiber optics across the entire state. Um, had some of the best uh, uh, rum I think I've ever had um, from my buddy, Greg. Uh, who I still talk to every now and again. And uh, it was just, it was, it was such a good, refreshing trip. And and I made a lifelong brother out the deal. Like he and I have since worked at the Bahamas together uh, within the last couple of years, we wrapped a, a lighthouse off of uh, Grand Harbor K, which is owned by Norwegian Cruise Lines. And um, Shane just always seems to show up at very pivotal moments in my life. Um, like, when we did the Bahamas job, like right after I came back from that, Macy and I started dating and it was just, it was, you know, and then that first job in, in Georgia, that's when I figured out riding with killers. And, um, he's a very, very beautiful soul. And, and, and he's, he's a wonderful person. And I'm just, I'm really happy that I got to meet him because honestly, I'm kind of sitting here because of my interaction with him. I have a friend who I have not talked to in a while, probably won't for a little bit, but I understand what you mean. Very pivotal moments. I mean, I, I'll, I'll mention her name. Her name is Gwen. But I remember there was such a, a like a, a very upsetting time period that I was getting out of. It was a learning curve in life. We all go through it. But I just remember through that time and even afterwards, there are so many moments I can attribute to be like, damn, we did this and we saw that. And, you know, I did that. And it, it just seemed like there would be an incident or not a bad, but a moment where we would hang out or we would reach out to each other and then some good would happen immediately after. We always have those friends that, are, that guide, whether you're, you know, religious, you know, spiritual, whatever you love the universe idea. You know, it's it's always, it's it's a comfort when we talk to them. But now we got to dive into Riding With Killers, man. This is okay. something special. So, you know, back to the other bands. You left Wildfire, Catharsis. And, you know, you said, like, for one of the first times you guys played together, it, it felt right. You know, you, you were the sole creator. And now the, the original member, you know, you write the songs, you have all this. What about writing with Killers made you feel different in your writing style? 
you know, what about this project? Do you think it's a, a combination of everything is finally reaching that, hey, this is the it moment? Kind of like when a wrestler starts like, hey, you know, they're in the indies and then they finally make it to WWE and they're huge. You know, did you feel like it was kind of like, not the peak of your writing ability, but now it was fine tuned? Yeah, you know, um, I would say I noticed there was a huge shift um, because even in Catharsis and Wildfire, like I did, I don't want to say I did all of the music because I can't say that, but I wrote a majority of it. You know, um, I always wanted to to write lyrics and get suggestions. And, and at the time, it just it wasn't happening. But um, when I jumped into this band, um, I noticed there was a bit of an elevation with the things that I was writing. And then I was finally getting to do lyrics because I I have things that I've wanted to write about for for years and years and years. I've had things on my mind and in my heart and this first record for Full Circle. Um, I mean, that's a collection of thoughts from I would I would even argue back to 2015 to um, to 2021, 2022. Um, and I didn't feel like I had any chains on me anymore. I didn't have someone just always shooting down my suggestions, even though they were happy to take the music that I would put out there. And um, it was just, it was incredible to, to get these thoughts and these feelings out. And, um, you know, I, I, I didn't, like I said, I didn't really have anything holding me back and I was finally getting to, to express my heart and my emotions and then from that i've noticed things have just been growing like i'm you know we we, we shot maybe one music video with catharsist and um it was a great video but with writing with killers i've done what four five now already i'm already i already finished the second record too by the way um i went to sweden and i did that and i noticed that now that i'm in the driver's seat and i'm at the helm and i don't have anybody to fight with me anymore that i'm actually progressing i'm starting to get to the places that i want to get to i'm starting to do the things that i want to do i mean shit i landed gibson and and seymour duncan i mean i've been with mesa boogie since 2016 and and i love those I, I love you mesa thank you for all the support over the years it's it's a dream to still be with my dream amp company but i noticed that more doors started to open you know when i branched out on my own and i it was you know i i took that leap of faith because i was never the lead singer i always did backing vocals and I knew that I liked to sing, um, but it was it was very scary to jump into that role in that position. But I knew that when I created this new project, I, I didn't want to deal with another lead singer who was going to fight me every step of the way and undermine things that I did. Um, and I feel like I gained. Um, oh, what's the right word? Um, I don't know. I just, I feel like I gained not, not, not power. That's not the right word that I'm looking for, but I, I gained my footing, I guess more. And I feel like I'm finally becoming who I was always supposed to be by branching off of my own. Like, dude, I didn't have red hair 24, seven, 365 when I was still doing all those other things. And, um, I just, I felt a sense of empowerment, um, to know that I could jump off on my own and that, it doesn't sound like shit. <laughs> so, you know, just to be crude, but um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a scary leap, but I, I feel like I needed to take it because I mean, look at where things are at now and where they're still heading, you know? I think of Eric Clapton when, you know, he was just a guitarist and he was on tour and there was a couple and he's like, Eric, you got a voice, man. You can sing. And he's like, I don't think he's like, bro, if you don't use it, you're gonna lose it. And ever since then, Eric Clapton actually started performing. But for you, man, it was a hell of a learning curve. Gave yourself a damn hernia singing hostility. And I, I, I wanted to know if it was like, okay, was it just something that you knew you had to do? Like, hey, you know what? I need to start singing. This is what I need to do. Or did somebody guide you? Because I know Jake, Jakey of Sarah, the uh, Swedish, Swedish rock band, was okay. guiding you. And he, he taught you some vocal lessons. Walk me through that initial decision, like I'm taking over. Was it somebody that encouraged you? Again, I, I think it comes back to 
whenever I, I formed the name and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then um, it, I think I pushed myself to it um, to sing because like even from a young age, like I always sang along with the radio. I always wanted to like, even, like no shame in my game, but I sing the fuck out of some Backstreet Boys when I was a kid. And I still do now, man. Like, mwah, Brother. love you guys. <laughs> Um, but I always found myself singing along to the radio and, um, and, and even when I was performing live, um, and I'm going to take it back to the old catharsis days, um, like back in 2008, whenever, um, we got the chance to open for Avenged Sevenfold and, and, um, Bullet for My Valentine and Atreyu, like, like the rev was still alive. Like everybody, like it, it was the time that you would want to play with those bands, um, I found myself, even though I wasn't singing main vocal parts, um, in between songs, I was always the guy that, um, I talked to the audience. I hyped up the crowd. I felt like I had a natural nag for it. And I, I, I found myself loving more and more being on a microphone. And, um, I always had this want in my soul to sing. Um, and you know, once I started doing it, you know, a lot of my friends from that I still stay in touch with from the Gulf Coast were like, bro, why didn't you start singing years ago while you were still living here? And it, it was an interesting question, you know, because I was like, well, I don't I don't really know. I, I didn't think that I had um, the balls to do it at the time. I was very scared of my own voice and, and I didn't know how to sing properly, like, which clearly that's why I got my damn hernia in studio which is funny about that by the way because it wasn't full blown it was like i i felt a weird pain and it went away and i was like guys i need to sit down and then um about two weeks later i i dropped some acid and um i was having a lovely lovely journey and then all of a sudden my body started communicating with me and it was like there were arrows that were like hey hey go to the emergency room right now. So I went to the emergency room on acid, tripping balls, trying not to laugh because, you know, it just makes you kind of goofy and giggly. Um, and everyone's in the ER like, and I'm just sitting in the corner like, don't laugh, don't laugh. But, um, you know, uh, the doctor, whenever he checked, he was like, he's like, dude, this is, this is like the smallest tear ever. How in the world did you realize you had this and i was like full disclosure i'm on acid right now and my body just told me and he was like okay well you're right so um that and it's see the way he um, responded tells me he used to do the same stuff <laughs> he didn't want to admit it because i've seen that <laughs> okay <laughs> you know what and this is this might sound weird and this is not me advocating for everybody to go out and do drugs but i think if you can find the right space the right headspace the right people to guide you through i i think everyone should have at least one go maybe cuz i feel like it opened up my mind to a different way of thinking and it 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 allowed me to communicate with my body that much better. That's, that's the whole reason I was able to fix myself was because I did that. And I was more in tune with myself. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, I went off a little too deep in the weeds. I'm sorry, ADHD, like a motherfucker. Um, but yeah, man, it was, uh, it was odd, but it, it, it forced me into vocal lessons, which I'm now taking lessons from a wonderful vocalist named Ryan Arini, who's up at Rock Hill Sound Studios in, uh, in Royal Oak, or I'm sorry, Rochester. Um, but, you know, I once I jumped into the, the vocal position and I started hitting cool stuff in studio, like, I, obviously, I want to be able to replicate that live and I want to have a long lasting career when it comes to this. So, um, in a way, the hernia was a huge blessing in disguise because it let me know that, okay, I can't just be all willy nilly about my vocals and my vocal health. Like I actually have to be serious. I have to take myself serious. I have to take my nutrition serious. And I have to take, like you were saying, like I, I've had to change my body. Like I used to be 245 pounds. I'm now at 160. Um, I flip between 155, 160 now maintaining, but I feel like that has helped me grow my vo my voice and my vocal cords. And, um, 
you know, like I'm incorporating more cardio now. So I have that stamina, that breath, uh, cause that's, that's the whole thing. I, I could sing, but I couldn't sing properly and I was pushing way too hard. And that's what caused that initial tear. The, the passion, you know what I mean when you give it your all uh, and you just, it, it, it's so physical. This is such a, uh, a physically demanding job that you do and that we participate when we play music and when, when we dive into it. You know, your Marvin gu acoustic guitar is beautiful. And a lot of the music you've written on it, you know, a lot of it just comes to you via that guitar. That's where you wrote most of your songs. And I was curious of like- You really did your research, by the way. Like you've been blowing my mind this entire time. I'm like, he knows way too much about me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know what? I, I ain't gonna lie to you. You were difficult to research. All right, it was it was a. I'm getting this law degree in. All right, <laughs> it's it's a bit. Uh, you're you're earning it, bro. That's awesome. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I was just. I'm very impressed. No, no, I really appreciate that. That is like um, that that's kind of the win for me when I get that that like, hey, you did a good job. Uh, but back to it, you know, it's there's there's a spirituality with instruments in a person, you know. We're guitarists, that's what we sing through. But I might be better on bass, you know, or there might be, a, I might be a better songwriter on drums. There's, shout out to my friend, Kat, my boy Cameron's wife, Kat. She has this gorgeous guitar. Every time I go to her house, man, I'm not a writer. You know, you'll come up with a riff, you'll wake up at 3 a.m. and I put something down. But every time I get that guitar in my hand, it is just the effortless flow of music and creativity and I was curious, when did you when did you start to feel that with your Marvin, and how many of the songs really got the whole bass at a full circle from that actual like those sessions with it? So I would say as soon as I got it, um, I, I bought this from a guy secondhand uh, off a of reverb. I think he was in. Um, South Carolina or or something like that but uh it wasn't even set up but like as soon as I pulled it out and I put my hands on it I was like okay this is it this is this is I, I don't need another acoustic and um I'd say a solid um I'd say a solid seven tracks from 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 full circle um because one of one, one's a cover so obviously that's not me um i did do this on my I, I wrote that on a seven string actually but i played on a baritone now um but yeah i would say a solid seven tunes like uh you know what comes next uh one of my favorite songs floating which is about macy um but that that like and that's a great example is that um after she and i had had like our our first date together and then we spent two nights together in new orleans i got home i picked up the martin and it just it, it popped out and um i i'll never forget that i knew it was going to be a beautiful and good song um i had gotten an invite to go up to the loft in saline michigan owned by the paddle brothers from sponge what up y'all um and dave coglin who was up there working with another wonderful wonderful artist her name is audrey ray um she's a country artist and i've i've actually got to play a show with her uh do a filling gig with them but um we were sitting down with all of our guitars just talking and chatting and i was like hey tell me what you think of this and then i did that initial first riff and i just kind of played it and i remember audrey stopped and she was like that is so beautiful and I could tell that she had some, like, like I could tell she was intently listening and that she, you know, she wasn't just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to compliment this guy and blah, blah, Like, I could tell that she actually listened to it. And, um, you know, I just, I know that whenever I pick that guitar up, um, something cool is going to come out. Um, and in and, and this, this song isn't even finished or released, obviously, because it's, uh, it's on the second record, but... Um, House on Fire is uh, probably one of my favorite songs that I've written yet, and it's all, it's just me and an acoustic. That's the funny part. It's 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 a straight acoustic song on that Martin, but um, I really got out a lot of pain and heartache with that one. But I know that it was because I had the Martin in my hand. Um, I just have a very special bond with that guitar. Um, it feels like it was made for my hands feels like it was made for me and um 
I don't know. I just, I go to a different world when I pick that guitar up. And, you know, I wanted to stress how I loved, like, while listening to the album, that you guys, you guys have some acoustic songs. One was like a country tune. I was like, whoa, 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 this is not the rock, metal, new. Oh, wait, that's still good. I can listen to this. Hold on. You know, it was, it, I, I really wanted to question what your feel was that. Because, you know, a lot of bands, when they do their, you know, their albums, it's a straight, like, hey, it's all rock or it's all country. You know, Metallica's yeah. Load is where you start to see them try to, hey, you know, we're going to put a country song. We're going to go a little slower. We're going to have a bluesier metal song. You know, did you ever yeah. have, like, any um, quarrels? Like, I really did love Novelty. But it, it just, it, it was one of those rare times where it's like, I heard it and I was like, this still fits in the the track listing perfectly for what they're doing. You know, did you have any reservations about doing that? Or are you just kind of like, no, let's just let the music talk. I feel like it's me, man. Cause I'm not, um, I'm not just one thing. I'm multiple things. I have multiple influences and it's not just rock music that I love. I, I, I love it all. And for me to be a musician and an artist, I, I don't, I don't want to just back myself into a corner or put myself in a box. I want to be able to do whatever the fuck I want, but it still sounds like me at the end of the day. Um, and I feel like a lot of my favorite artists also have that capability to where, Hey, yeah, you know us for this, but check this out. And it's still amazing. It still hits you the same way, but it's, it's a totally different ride. And that's, something I've always wanted to be able to do as an artist um, is I want to be the guy that can fit on any bill, any tour, and it doesn't seem weird. It kind of, it kind of like, I, I call it, it's my Deftones theory. Like, dude, Deftones, you can put them on any bill with any band and everyone's going to be like, fuck yeah, dude, Deftones are here. It's going to be a good night because they can adjust their set. They can play with Slipknot or even Black Dahlia Murder or, or whoever the fuck. And then you can put them with Seether. You can put them with, you know, Papa Roach or, or Incubus even or, 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 or whoever. And even like pop artists, man. Like they're like, um, I forget what, I think they're doing Coachella or something like that uh, this year. And they're with, um, I can't think of all the pop artists um, from this year's lineup, but you know what I'm saying? Like it, it's not weird that Deftones are a part of that lineup. And that's something that I've always wanted to be able to do. And it's not that I try to write different songs to, for the sake of being different. I just let what's in my heart come out. And if it comes out as a country tune or an acoustic tune, and at some point, man, I'll start including some electronica because I fucking love EDM. And I think that there are so many aspects of EDM music that can be transferred to rock and that's something I'm going to probably want to do on the third record, you know? So I, I don't ever want to be this person that, that feels limited in what I can create. So that's always kind of been my mindset is I'm just going to let whatever I'm feeling come out. And, you know, if it sounds different, that's okay. Cause I don't want to just keep writing the same song over and over and over. That's, that's boring. You know, you can only paint with the color red so many times before it becomes, you know, boring. <laughs> DNA is the latest single that you guys dropped on us. And I'm listening to this. I'm like, yo, I don't know. How, I, I know hostility was good, but I'm like, yo, DNA got me. That's that's my jam on this on this album. You know, I always ask for the artist to give a full perspective of the writing of that. And if there was yeah. any difficulties or something, because to me, that was more of the it, it it was so fun, but it was so strong and so aggressive. I felt like that was the one that encompassed writing with killers when I first initially saw, not saying heard the music, but when you see the pictures and you see the promo, that was the song. I was like, yeah, that's that's what I'm listening to. Love that. That's, that's honestly one of my favorite songs that, that we've put out. And that song was, um, it, I, I would say it was rather easy because we, so we did that one. And that's and what's funny about that we recorded that song in a basement um most of this record was actually recorded in a basement not like a big fancy studio we were at uh and, and don't get me wrong the basement studio that we had was fucking awesome it belongs to uh mark papo uh, from lansbury lane studios um 
I essentially kind of helped him build that a little bit. Like he had a good majority of it, but when I was working at Sweetwater, I essentially helped get all the outboard gear, like, like nicer outboard gear, nicer mics in like, Hey, use my discount. I'm not going to make any commission, but I want to help you build the studio. Cause that's where we were creating at. Um, Matt LaPlante flew in, um, Tim Krukowski and, uh, Dave Coglin were, you know, Tim did bass and he helped me with the vocal writing as well. And, um, basically I feel like we kind of put that song together really fast, um, for the fact that like, I already knew what the story was. Um, th this The title is actually my friend's initials, DNA. It just happened to work out that way. Um, but that song was about um, one of my absolute, I, and I don't even want to call him a friend because he's, he's a brother at this point. He's family. Um, but he was one of the first people. He was actually the only person. Let me say that. Um, no, no, he was the first person because obviously I've had wonderful friends after him that have encouraged me but he was the first person that approached me like a human being about my weight and about my struggles that I had and he would always send me these beautiful beautiful text messages like hey brother I'm thinking about you do yourself a favor go train today like be good to yourself and and he would just he would hit me up at the right times and then after we both moved away from the Gulf Coast, he fell into one of the deepest, darkest depressions I think I've ever had one of my friends fall into. Um, got really bad off on alcohol. Like he almost died like multiple times. And he would call me in the middle of these throws. And I didn't care where the fuck I was at. If he called me, I answered. Um, and even if we didn't have a real conversation and he would he would, like he would be crying on the phone, he would be saying just uh, it was so incoherent. Like you couldn't understand what he was saying, but I stayed on the phone. I talked with him. Um, and basically luck and, and, and thank what, you know, whatever deity you believe in the universe, God, whatever it is like, like, thank, thank God that he was able to get sober. Like he's got a family now. He just had his first kid within the last year and a half. And like, he's a family man now. And he's, he's out in California, just absolutely thriving. But I knew that I wanted to write about that whole scenario because I, I thought he was going to die. I thought he was going to die on the phone with me a couple of times. And like the verses of those songs, like why the reason it has that AM vocal effect, it's kind of like, I felt like that was my phone call with him. And, and that's what that song is. That, that song is, is the accompaniment of all of our phone calls during his struggles and you know, that it, it kind of came together pretty quickly. You know, um, that's one of those songs that that I'll definitely be proud of till the day that I die, because it's not just, hey, let's write a cool sounding song and hopefully we find some lyrics that sound badass that people get in. Nah. But like it actually has real meaning. And it's, you know, it's it's for one of my favorite people who who helped save me from myself with my eating habits and and just all the wrong things that I were doing that, that I was doing to my body and to my myself. And then to turn around and get to be there for him. in those times it was, it was very cool. And that was my way to commemorate um, my love for him. And, and our relationship was that song. So um, it, it kind of came together pretty quick, you know, and he's aware of this, right? He knows, like, hey, this is... <laughs> I, I got his blessing because it was a very serious time. And I, I wanted to make sure that he wasn't going to feel... Because you know how sometimes that can be. Like, because it's, it's, it's not a pretty song. It's an ugly song. It's, it's, it talks about some of the most grotesque parts of our humanity. And, but it's also beautiful at the same time. But I wanted to make sure that I wouldn't upset him by throwing not only my story with him, but essentially I put his story out there, you know? Um, but I only did it because I love him and I care about him. And it was my way of saying, thank you for saving me, you know? Cause that's, 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 that's how I knew how to repay him was, was writing a song that, you know, I'm, it's, it's always going to be in our set. You know, that's, that's, that's a staple song for, for our live show. 
I love the, the tie-ins. I know you've alluded and mentioned it in other interviews about how every song is a, a facet or experience in life. And back to the weight issues, that's what Vultures was about. Now, tell me yes or no, that's got to be a fun song to play. Just as a guitarist, man-to-man, -man, you know, on the strings. I just feel like I, I have to know, did you, did it take some a little bit of like getting used to the singing and playing? Because I feel like, yo, give me my guitar. I'm, I'm off. Let's go. This is my song. Funny enough, we have not actually performed that one live. Uh, we will be playing it this summer, though. Like, once we get back out, like, um, that'll probably be a song we premiere in Pittsburgh next month uh, with our friends and guides, which, what up, Fraud Durst? Love you, bro um but it is a very hard song to sing and play at the same time because there's no there's no room for breath in that song um there's a lot of vocals there's a lot of you know ba da ga da ga 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 da ga da 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 and then da 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 like it's a weird thing to do simultaneously but um like we've gotten it down we've been rehearsing it because uh that that is a song that i am very proud of as well that's one of my other favorite songs on this record just because it is so fucking pissed off and it's 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 just mean but uh it it's a blast like uh i love the guitar riff i love uh Especially like when it stops and, it, and and there's that single note that's just trilling along that da -na 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 -na, and you've got the bass line falling, but it just it it gives you that that head bop and it's like all right, this is an aggressive song. I'm pissed off. Let's let's go. So um, that's definitely one of the more fun ones. And like the solo is is super fun on that. That's kind of like my signature style with the way that I, I kind of solo, like I'm not a big like sweet picker guy, but I do like the speed picking and, and the trill kind of stuff. Um, but that one was a, it was a really fun one. Cause you know, going to wrestling, man, I imagined that I was in a wrestling ring and I was going against all these opponents, you know, and it, and it wasn't just the weight, man. It was, it was all the things that I had to work on with, with, with my personality, the way that I presented myself to the world, the weight, um the everything and i i just felt like when i was writing it it's like okay i'm working on my life but i have this audience of people looking in and every now and again someone will try to give me unsolicited advice or they'll they'll do this judgment it's like no no stop fuck off i'm working on me i know that you see me but i'm working on me and 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 my opponents in my head was the weight the depression, the doubt, the, you know, just, just all these things that we sometimes allow to consume who we are. And it puts us in this place of doubt. This was, this was my song to fight back against that. So um, it's just, it's just a fun, aggressive tune all the way around. Um, yeah. I, I I'm excited to start playing that one. And man, I know you wanted to do the music video of you like wrestling and having everybody, man, this would be the That's perfect. Cool. Perfect. Okay, because I was about to say AEW around the corner. We can get that rock and get this thing in there with the chair. <laughs> Listen, let's get it's, it's, the, the problem is, is um, no, it's not a problem, but in a way it is. Um, I mean, dude, I, I'm self-funding all of this myself. I don't I don't have a financial backer anymore. I don't have a record label. I don't have a rich mom and dad that are like, oh, we believe in you. So it's it's I'm I'm having to essentially create this as I'm able to, but I've already started conversations on on this. Like it's it's gonna be funny. That's that's the best part. It's gonna be it'll be serious, but it'll be hilarious at the same time. And um once I get to bring this vision to life, I think that'll be a really fun and big music video for us. But I, I've got big plans for that song this year. It's just all your music is truly how it's supposed to be. You know, hostility, knowing your story is obviously the single that should have came out first. I know I said DNA, but that knowing the whole story, knowing everything you've been through, that is the combination of like, okay, we're here to play. And you said that song, you know, it was reminiscent. You, you thought about the people, like you mentioned, some people that were trying to tell you like, hey, you know, you should do this or they were in your ear. And during an interview, you got very candid about, you know, there were people that would break you down and how grateful you were to your wife for being part of the process of, you know, helping you like be confident. But I was curious, like, you know, who you don't have to give names, 
but I was curious, like, who were, what was some of the situations that really were, like, the make or break? Because, like you said, during the pandemic, it was, am I going to keep doing this? You had your business going for painting. I, I would say, like, the people that that really helped me push forward, um, and, I, and I, I don't mind giving names, um, and I'll give a few, and, and, and the few that I give, it, it's not a whole, a representation of, of all the people um but i would say the people that really made me keep going and didn't make me want to stop I, I would say ed bridal um scott fox kenny vest um matt laplante even um and a lot of various friends from the gulf coast um that i still stay in touch with um i didn't want to let those people down because they believed in me they gave me chances they helped me out with shows, with opportunities, with finances to ensure that I could continue being me and doing the art that I wanted to do. And I, and I felt like if I, if I gave up, man, like, why did, why did they even give me these chances? Why did they even take a shot on me? And I felt like I was going to be letting down people that, that actually did believe in me. And, and, you know, the, and, and, and more so, like, like I'll, I'll say Ed's probably at the top of that list um, because that man, he did more for me and my music career than I think anyone will ever realize. And if I would have just stopped, like, what a slap in the face to, to someone who treated me like a son and acted like a father figure to me. Like, I, I can't let him down, you know? Um and as far as those other people, I mean, um, the ones that helped inspire the songs, like I, I've definitely had talks with, with, with a few of them. Some of them, there's no point, you know, like that would just further the divide or further the, the unpleasantries that, that are associated with those people. But um, I, I know in my heart that I forgave them. I think they probably know that too, because I mean, that's, that's what writing music is. It's, it's, it's that process of healing and letting go. Um, but I, I would say the, that those are the main people is, you know, is, is my family and friends back from the Gulf coast and, and a lot of those names that I just mentioned. And I, I gotta give a shout out to Greg Sutton too, man. I just spoke with him the other day. He's down at 99 rock in Destin, which you're, you're Florida. If you ever get a chance to go up to club LA and, and see all of those guys, they're, they're so absolutely wonderful. And, um, you know, it's just, I, I don't want to let the people down that took a chance on me because they they cared enough to listen they cared enough to give me a voice and and what a waste if i wouldn't continue to use that voice so that's that's kind of where that will to continue on kind of came from is i i i cannot bear the thought of having these people that i love and cherish disappointed in me after they gave me all this support it's something to be said, like the support of your friends. And one thing I love that I want you to just go full in depth on, I didn't even want to try and explain it for the viewers, was the Novelty Project and how it helps with, um, excuse me, it helps with raising money and it directly goes to organizations that help with mental health and et cetera. So walk me through how that got started and how you're still, um, I want to say grooming it to help others. You know, we ended, I, I worked with an artist named Jamie um, and she's absolutely wonderful. And if you watch the novelty music video, that little voodoo doll, she made that. Um, and it was around the time that we were starting to get the mixes back and, and we were starting to really build that because it started off as an acoustic tune. Um, but once we heard it, we realized just how powerful the song is and and will be like i feel like that will be one of these songs that helps us be remembered down the line but you know that that song is essentially about me being a novelty it, 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 and not just one relationship you know uh, across multiple relationships where i i just felt like a play thing that i was being used for someone's amusement like no one ever wanted to commit to me or Hey, he's the guy. He's the one. It was like, no, he's just a fun ride. We can use him. We'll get our kicks, get our thrills, and then we'll throw him away. And um, I just, I remembered all the pain 
from all of that that I siphoned into that song. And um, around that time, you know, I was starting to get more familiar with um, to write Love on Her Arms. And that's kind of what they do, man. They're there at every music festival. Doesn't matter if it's rock, EDM, blues, jazz, whatever. But they show up and they're there to let you know that you matter and that you, the world is a better place with you in it. And I just always thought that they did such beautiful work. And uh, one of my favorite bands um, at the time was was nothing more. And I, I saw that they were doing work with it, with, with them. And um, once I started kind of formulating the idea behind this, um, after I got that first voodoo doll, the idea in my head was, okay, well, this is what we should do to, to do our part, you know, to help out to write love on our arms is that, you know, um, I would get 25 to 30 voodoo dolls. We would number them individually, but we would write positive messages on the back and they were all different. Um, and then we would sell them for like 40 bucks a piece. And you, they, that was your raffle ticket. And since I'm an artist with Gibson, I have access to Epiphone guitars and I get them at a really, really great price. And I'm not talking your cheapy $125 beginner guitars. Like I'm, looking at your eight and $900 Epiphone Les Paul standard or, or an SG standard, you know, like, like real guitars. And um, my thought was as well, let's let me buy a guitar. Let me raffle these off. We'll send the money to right low in our arms. And even if you didn't win, you still have a positive message that, that, that I hope will impact your life and that you will go forth and spread that message to others through your actions. But you know, we're, we're raising money for an organization that, that is all based around mental health and, um, which is a big thing for me because I've struggled with it. And then at the same time, I'm putting a real guitar in someone's hands, you know, you can play it on stage, you can write with it, or you can hang it up, which I hope you're not going to hang it up, you know, but that was my way of how do I get instruments in people's hands and how do I help support an organization that I fully and truly believe in and, and do something that's a little different and unique from everybody else. And that was kind of where the novelty project came into play because that voodoo doll, you know, it's the beginning of the video, you know, and the whole idea of that music video and that song is that you're just a toy for somebody else to to use abuse and throw away eventually and um you know that's like the line you know i'm not your fucking novelty there's so much more to me and and that's that's why i think it's such a beautiful joining of of the two entities between with what that song is and what i'm doing and with to write love on her arms um, is that you're not just a toy for other people. You do matter. You do have a voice. You do have a place on this earth. And, um, you know, music is going to be the reason why you keep on. It's the reason why I keep on. So, you know, you incorporate all that and then you throw really wonderfully well-made instruments into the mix. You, I feel like you've got a winning combination. Uh, you know, and you've spoken of your wife, how she's been a, an anchor for you, man. But me being the romantic guy, especially with Valentine's Day, just around, you know, just happened. You know, what what, what was the moment you realized that, like, you know what, this, this, this is different. This is it. I remember a person I can't mention, you know, got to change the name to protect the guilty now. But I remember one time... I was I was hanging out with her at a foreigner concert. There's a whole convoluted story to get there, and we finally hang out. And I like I didn't even want to, and then we're hanging out, and then you know, I was like, in my head, I was just like, damn, I could marry this girl. I had to pull it back. I was like, wait, I don't know this girl. What am I saying? Now, funny enough, she said, well, the guy I'm dating. I'm like, what the hell are you doing here? But it it evolved over years into it's a beautiful story that ended with the black keys. But you know, there there's that moment you you have that that spiritual connection, you know, when was that for you having gone through the mental issues, having gone through a lot of animosity with others? Well, funny enough, um, it was right around another Shane trip when we went to the Bahamas. Um, she and I had our first date, um, right before I left, like the night before we left to go out and work out there. Um, I would say that was probably the moment I knew. Um, we went to Lafitte's, uh, which is the oldest bar 
operating still in New Orleans, uh, lit by candles and, um, you know, and, and, and really quick before I get to that, I, I have to backtrack a little bit, but like um, the place that I figured out who I was as a person, Pinkston's, that's where I met her. Um, she was taking vocal lessons from Fritzy and, um, you know, we, we never really hung out. But we always saw each other. There was always little small hellos. And then I would find myself at concerts and there she was. She like she was always around me for some strange reason. Like we even lived at the same apartment complex at one point in our lives. We found out our childhood homes were a mile down the road from one another. Um, and it was just all these really interesting little things scattered throughout life. But the moment I I, I knew it was while we were sitting at Lafitte's. Um we were just sitting there. We, we, we had had a wonderful dinner. It was, it was the best first date I I've ever had. Um, and we were, she was like, I want to take you here. And, uh, we were just sitting down in this little corner. Like you have to walk around the bar and we went to the back and we were just sitting in a corner talking, enjoying ourselves. And then a guy walks up to the piano and he's talking. And, and then finally we're like, wait, he's talking to us. And he was like, guys, do you have any requests? Like, you're breaking my balls here. <laughs> and I was like, all right, cool. Tiny Dancer by Elton John, because it's one of my favorite songs of all time. And Elton John was my first live music experience. And I just, I see a piano player, like, I, I want to hear Elton John, you know, especially if you're singing and playing. And um, he started playing Tiny Dancer. And I'm just sitting there watching, enjoying. And I'm like, man, life feels really good right now. And it was about to feel even better because she scooted next to me and she grabbed my hand and put her head on my shoulder. And I was like, oh, fuck. You know what I mean? I, it was like right there. I was like, yo, I love you. I, you're you're it. Like, I just, I knew right there in that moment. Like, um, and then I annoyed the absolute fuck out of everybody in the Bahamas for the next two weeks because I would not shut up about her or the first date. And they're like, God damn, dude, stop it. But I mean, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I love that man, and I haven't been that guy. You know, when they make the move and it's reciprocated, man, that 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 burst of adrenaline, man. I I, I remember when it happened to me. I thought it was love. You know, it was adrenaline. Calm down. You know, it was, it was built up. You know, but I love. I absolutely adore stories like that, man. It, it, even even if it was like straightforward or if it was convoluted, you know, it's always it's always beautiful. You know. As a performer, you know, uh, Philadelphia is my second home. I'm from New Jersey. Yes, I, currently oh, Studio B is in Florida. But Philadelphia is the home away from home. It has kicked my ass. It indoctrinated me. And is basically, it's one of the most charming cities with so much history in, in our entertainment field. You know, I was curious if you had any stories on the East Coast playing there that stick out in your mind. Or even better, if you had any defining moments as a uh, as a performer that you were like you know it wasn't philly but i do remember a really good time because something something i thought interesting you did the um you did the, i think it's the dark the talia hall show where you're on stage by yourself yeah. playing and wow. to me to me that's wow. one of those things where it's like when it's just you and and your instrument you know nobody else that you you can be very naked and what i loved about that was i don't know if this is true but i i believed it was an empty theater that you played in. Uh, you just like I just got a shiver like I wish you could see it like I just got goosebumps bringing myself back to that but that was that was a very wild moment um it was it was so eerily quiet but it was so comfortable at the same time but um the uh, that moment that you're speaking about um it didn't happen there it's close um, but I would say there, there's probably two moments of that that stick out the most right now. Um, I would, and, and one's with Taproot and one's with me. Um, I would say Taste of Madison with Taproot. That was where we did the all white out. But like I had been dreaming about that festival for probably a solid 10 years. Like I was always the, the, the music industry nerd. I would look at all the, 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 cliff notes on the cds and i would research who is who i would research festivals all over the country and that was one that always stood out to me because i mean the backdrop is insane you've got a sea of people you have the state capital behind you and i just remember i had such a moment of clarity last year or i was headbanging and then i came up and then i saw everything and it clicked 
And it was like, dude, do you realize where you're at and what you're doing and how powerful this moment is? Um, and I, I kind of knew I was worth my grit at that point. And the other time, it's also another empty theater. Um, but this was in Gothenburg, Sweden, when I was over there with Jacob recording the second writing with Killer's record. We did the vocals over there. We did the vocal writing and the blueprinting and writing melodies and all that. And we finished vocals in Detroit. But um, and we did something very, very special in that theater. So it's it's like the theater is built in like the 1800s or something. Like it's a very, very, very or no, I think it was the 1400s. I've. Jacob's going to kill me. I can't exactly, but it's a very, very super old theater, like 3000 cap kind of a place like the chandeliers original. Um, but I, I unfortunately had a very, very good friend of mine from high school. Her name was Shay Smith. She passed away. Um, I never got to say goodbye, which really fucking hurt. Like I remember I got home. My mom was like, Hey, did you know that she's in the hospital with cancer? And I was like, what do you mean? I tried to send a text or, a, or it was a Facebook message and like it didn't get there in time. Like like literally after I sent that text, I think she died maybe hour and a half, two hours later. And obviously she's not going to be on her phone. She's not going to be doing anything. And um, that was still is really hard. Um, and I got to say goodbye to her in Sweden. Um Sorry, uh, I, I I did um, I did an acoustic, really really sad broken down version of Heart Shaped Box, which was my goodbye to her, and that was her favorite band. And for some reason, when you're a kid, you hate things because, oh, I I shouldn't have to like this, so I'm gonna dislike it. And Nirvana was that band for me. I was like, oh, Nirvana's a popular. Fuck them. I don't I don't like Nirvana. And Shay always tried so hard and she succeeded clearly because like here I am, I, 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 I did a cover of that song for her and we, we've got a little video and like that'll be something I release later. But um, that was a very defining moment because I felt like I was singing to the heavens almost, you know, with with the way that that room was and how empty, but how gorgeous it was and there's these beautiful paintings on the ceiling like, like almost like michelangelo-esque and um hi buddy <laughs> and uh that was uh i would say that is a very standout moment for me because you know it was i yeah, there's a couple takes where i started crying and you know i mean shit i just got choked up just now thinking about it but that that was a, a very defining moment you know, uh, I would say, and it was, it, it just meant a lot to be able to do that. So. And I, I can't say I know what it's like to perform in that setting. I had a very kind, um, gentleman in New York when I went to go see rage. Uh, there's this speaking of killing somebody killing you. I forgot the name of this place. Every major star has performed there. It is, it is the bell of the ball. It doesn't matter if it's rock or pop, hip hop. Everybody has performed there, and I can't remember, but it has so much, so much um, royalty to it. Um, I forget what the hall's name, but I went there just to visit to see if I could see it, and uh, they were Carnegie Hall. Or Thank you, my brother. I went to Carnegie Hall. I don't know why that just. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> but I I went there. The security guard had pity on me. He was very kind. You know, no tours, but he allowed me to go in by myself for a short a period of time. And you feel the gravity, the energy, of a, a place like that. And you reminiscing and speaking. That's just a beautiful story you have, man. It it it's nothing like it being in there by yourself. I can't imagine performing and actually showcasing it to to heavens like that you know i i always end these with the last question most important what's the best piece of advice someone has given you but you having had so much i gotta really flesh this one out man because the sponsorships and the music and the the influence is just crazy but you know going back to what i mentioned with ted aguilar you know he during the interview it was it was almost like it was a prophetic he said you know just live you know, the way the world's going, things might get crazy. And I've had some really funny interactions with people like uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Doyle, Wolfenstein, Wolfengang, all that. You know, the Misfits guitars. He's like, the FX gigantic, by the way. My God. 
God, he's huge. <laughs> he is, man. In person, it's scary. You're like, damn, bro. Like, <laughs> I met him uh, at Nam show, and I'm pretty sure his head is as big as my torso. Man, how I, I, was, he was he like? Was he? Was he still? Oh, like, he was a sweetheart. You know? he was yeah, all right. So he was man. himself. All right, cool, cool. Oh yeah, he was awesome. Super awesome. Really rad guy. Just the rock star whole whole thing, you know, with, with the misfits. But uh, he's he's very kind, very nice, and uh, I had a great interaction with him. I thought he was wonderful. Yeah, man. When he's on, there's a misconception, you know, because he's on stage. You know, he's doing him. But when he when you talk to him, nicest dude, man. But his, yep. his his advice was, is the effing you're giving worth the effing you're getting? You know, a little bit more, you know, fun. So, you know, for for you, you know, what's advice that, you know, every now and again you just, it, it pops up or you remember it and it's kind of that guiding light to like, okay, you know what? Let me take a chill pill. Let me keep going. Let me keep pushing. You know, it's it's very instrumental. Um, I would say, uh, I guess it would come down to like, if you're doing it for the right reasons. And you actually have a real passion and love for it that the right things will come um you know like 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 dude i i love guitar i love singing i love what music does for me and and i i didn't get into this because i wanted to be rich or famous or or get the girls or whatever i did it because i feel like i'm actually me when i'm playing guitar when i step on stage it's like I step through a portal and I become the truest form of myself and I want to connect with other humans. I want to connect with other people. I want to use my music to heal. I want to get, I want to reach some angry kid in my state across the country, across the world that grew up the way that I did and then be like, Hey, I'm not alone. So if you have real intention and real love, then the results are going to be real. And they're going to nine times out of 10 be what you want them to be. So I would say approach everything with love, with realism and for the right reasons. And that's kind of what I try to do with myself, you know, and that's, that's what I keep coming back to is like, well, if I actually love this and I actually believe in it, I'm going to do the right things and I'm going to find the right path. So go in with the right intentions and the right things will come out. Man, that was so beautifully well put. Ladies and gentlemen, Taylor Roberts, go check them out. I, I remember seeing their picture for the first time. I was like, this is a kick-ass band. Riding with Killers, full circle out now. You can find them on social media. Go to IG, go to Spotify, listen to the music first, but full circle out everywhere on every digital platform. And again, their IG and Facebook is Riding with Killers. Taylor, that was so fun. I can't, I can't yeah, express I it, man. man. Thank you. <laughs> no problem, man. We're going to be hearing from soon because you heard that second, you know, the albums are coming. So everybody, check them out. As always, be smart, be mindful, rock on. And of course, Ninja out. Yo, what's up, guys? This is Taylor Roberts from the band Riding With Killers and the band Taproot. We're coming to kick your fucking ass this year, so be on the lookout. Also, to the ladies of Kitty, my wife said I could propose to all of you, so be ready for that at Sick New World this year, and we'll see you soon. <laughs> Yo, that's the go-off. <laughs> you got a loving wife, too. I know mine go up playing no games. She'd be like, "Yo, <laughs> man, thank." Uh, because the the truth is, she knows <laughs> that like they they might slightly accept me, but she's the real prize at the end of the rope. So you know, whatever. And I uh, <laughs> I adore those stories, man. As you can tell, I'm still single as a Pringle, but. Uh, back to that that girl I kept on alluding to that friend was the one at the concert of Foreigner and uh, it, she had tickets to the killers I was gonna you know, like hey let's let's hang out you know fun story and I hate to interrupt you but I, and if you want to throw this in there I think it would be hilarious but I um I brought my Mesa Boogie amp into a repair shop one time and I was talking to the guy and I was like yeah I'm sponsored by Mesa he's like oh who do you play for and I was like riding with killers and he was like you're in the killers and i was like no the look of utter disappointment on his face and he's like oh okay and then he just walked back and i was like all right fuck me i guess <laughs> Man, it's it's messed up how integral they became part of my career you know too because like um Baby, you listen to John the Ninja. All your ears are about to go on a vacation. John the Ninja's got what you need.